All right, so I'm going to cover a fair amount of material. So I'm going to sort of rush through a bit. Um, I feel like I should also mention that so far, and I think throughout the conference, we'll be discussing a lot of sort of dark issues, somewhat abstractly. In this presentation, I will definitely get into, into more concrete issues that um, some people may find slightly disturbing. I certainly do. Uh, okay, so let's start first with this graph. This is um, modified from a graph created originally by Gary Ackerman, a friend and colleague of mine. So it essentially just shows that it, you know, one instance of one single attack, uh, the number of individuals that you can kill has increased significantly over time, from spears, arrows, and clubs, to thermonuclear war. Of course, uh, North Korea just detonated what appears to be not an atomic bomb, but a hydrogen bomb, uh, which is uh, quite frightening. So then next, consider this graph. So this shows essentially the increasing destructive capabilities of both states and non-states. In addition, it shows that the power is convergent. Uh, so in other words, um, as Benjamin Woods and Gabriel Blum put it in their book, uh, Future Violence, uh, there's unprecedented distribution of offensive capabilities across society. So uh, and there are so this this essentially captures like pretty much all of my research interests right now. What is the future of government when uh, the power had by non-state actors is more or less uh, comparable to the power had by state actors? What does that do to uh, the, the social contracts uh, upon which one might argue modern states are based? Uh, but my other issue is following that curve up there, what sort of individuals if they had the capacity to uh, inflict global scale or existential destruction on humanity, what sort of actors <coughs> would um, intentionally or erroneously uh, bring about an existential catastrophe? So this raises the issue of error versus terror. Um, I'm not super satisfied with this matrix, but uh, you can see non-malicious intended. That might be the unilateralist curse, where somebody, you know, a single uh, state, for example, decides to initiate some uh, geoengineering, stratosphere geoengineering regime, and it turns out that that um, uh, has unintended consequences that are really quite bad. Um, malicious error, I know a lot of existential risk scholars are particularly worried about that. That might be uh, a state who does not, ha does not have any desire to inflict uh, an existential catastrophe, and yet there are cascading effects within systems and uh, causal uh, links between different systems that ultimately culminate in some sort of existential scale catastrophe. Uh, so for this talk, I will mostly be discussing the first, uh, the top left and the bottom right. Okay, so in terms of agential error, uh, this, is a, this is a highly idealized uh, circumstance because there would be safeguards in place and so on. Uh, but let's just imagine that there are 10 billion people, which is more or less accurate, 9.3 projected by Pew uh, 2050. Imagine there are 10 billion behaviorally fallible people on future Earth who all have access to a doomsday button. We can imagine this as, a, as, a, as an app or something you know, that's next to uh, you know, Twitter or FaceTime, whatever. So you just open the app and you hit the, the button and, and everybody dies. Um, so if pushed, yeah, the button would initiate a weapon of total destruction, as I like to call it. Uh, if every person had a mere 0.004 chance of pushing this button per century, the probability of civilizational doom would be 99%. Uh, if it were 500 people who, who had access, that's uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a really, really tiny percentage of a population of 10 billion. Um, they would just need a 1% chance per century for civilization to more or less, uh, for doom to be more or less guaranteed. Um, by the way, that's the 0 0.04 chance. That is a lower chance of you uh, dying of, from a coconut falling in your head. Just as a point of reference. Uh, so this is essentially the situation that's, that's uh, you know, the, the capacity for individuals to inflict uh, unprecedented harm on civilization or humanity is increasing. Um, every terror agent uh, has the capacity for error, of course, but not every error agent has the capacity for terror. So there's an asymmetry there. I think th this uh, image in particular makes me especially worried about error moving forward. A neglected topic in my judgment. So as for terror, you find a number of 
terms in the literature, crazies, maniacs, lunatics, misanthropes, uh, garage fanatics, and psychopaths, David Broden, that's his term, uh, suicidal regimes and terrorists. Uh, Carl Sagan wrote a couple of dots, uh, can we humans be trusted with civilization-threatening technologies? Consider some misanthropic sociopath like a Hitler or Stalin eager to kill everyone, a maniac lusting after greatness and glory, a victim of ethnic violence bent on revenge, someone in the grip of unusually severe testosterone poisoning. Some, uh, that's a term that I think was coined by Alan Alda, he was an advisor at the Future of Life Institute. Um, some religious fanatic hastening the day of judgment, or just technicians incompetent or insufficiently vigilant in handling the controls of, and safeguards. Such people exist. Um, so I believe that we can do a bit uh, I'll go homage to saying it, but I think we could do a bit, a bit better uh, in terms of a typology. So, yeah, we can impose some sort of ontological conceptual order on, on this, this chaotic investment precision. This leads me to a six part typology. Four uh, categories are human, two are, are not. Unfriendly machine super intelligence is perhaps the most obvious. If it were coupled with sufficiently powerful technologies, uh, it could potentially induce a uh, global catastrophe. Uh, belligerent extraterrestrials in the previous talk, I mentioned Machiavellian and Tuckerian agents. Uh, you can ask me afterwards if you're curious about that. Also, apocalyptic terrorists, negative utilitarians, uh, radical negative utilitarians, uh, extreme eco terrorists, and what I call idiosyncratic factors. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief survey of these types and then talk about some uh, implications of this particular framework. Uh, okay, so apocalyptic terrorists. This is a figure that comes from Richard Landis, who's a very influential uh, terrorism scholar. It essentially shows that there are, in terms of, of eschatological uh, beliefs, you can fall anywhere between the passive mode, where you believe supernatural agency is mostly causally responsible for uh, the unfolding, you know, the, the cataclysmic events of the eschaton, or have an active mode, where you believe that you are uh, responsible, or your group is responsible for actually catalyzing those events. Transformative tends to be a less, uh, less abrupt transition from our current this world to uh, future paradise. Cataclysmic, this is generally where you, uh, you know, Armageddon would, would fall here. So, like in the bottom left corner, you might have a lot of the dispensationalist rapture folks. Uh, it's a very popular view in the U.S. Jesus is going to come down and rapture uh, all the Christians, and then there will be seven year tribulation, the second coming, and then Armageddon. So it's cataclysmic, but ultimately it's not up to you to, to bring about this event. Um, you know, top right, you might have, like, you know, repent now, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The most worrisome, though, are the top left. Those are uh, where individuals or groups believe that the world must be destroyed in order to be saved. And it's up to them, there's some divine uh, mandate, uh, divine uh, command for them to actually go out and try to destroy the world in order for uh, the, the last hour to uh, occur. So, are there examples of you know, active apocalyptic movements? Uh, absolutely, there are a, there's a huge number across history. Um, some obvious examples, uh, oh, so I should say, yeah, far more than people realize. Uh, I also have a paper called The Clash of Eschatologies, which, which uh, discusses how eschatological beliefs have fueled many of the most significant uh, world events from World War II to, uh, to ISIS. Um, so maybe the most obvious example is El Shariqiyo. It was headed by a guy, a mostly blind uh, prophet named Asahara Shoko. And uh, they, the, El Shariqiyo was responsible for the 1995 Tokyo subway um, a sarin attack, which killed a few people and injured a uh, large number. And they initiated that attack uh, specifically to, at least according to many accounts, specifically to bring about Armageddon, which is as World War III between the US and, and Japan. Um, Daesh is a, is a derogatory term for the Islamic State. Um, it's been uh, Abu Musa al-Zarqawi was the sort of the grandfather, and he had extremely, uh, he was very much motivated by apocalyptic views. He has this famous quote that's, that's become uh, widely mentioned among ISIS fighters, which is, you know, we're going to, the, the, the fire has been lit here in Iraq, and we'll meet the Roman army in uh, Debi. 
And Dabiq is a, a very small town in northern Syria, right next to Aleppo, which you may have heard of. And that's where Armageddon, the, the Islamic Armageddon is supposed to happen. Um, Christian identity has been a highly influential uh, view uh, in the US, has influenced uh, Aryan nations, Ku Klux Klan, pretty much all of the, uh, the hate groups, uh, terrorist groups in the US that might immediately come to mind, uh, including the Covenant Sword and the Arm of the Lord. They actually ran a anti-overcomer training camp, uh, which had 1,500 people or so, and they were preparing for the end of the world, for essentially for an apocalyptic war that they were going to try to induce, uh, because they believe that white Europeans are the true, uh, the true Israelites, and the Jewish people are not only uh, the literal offspring of Satan, but uh, imposters. So they must be destroyed, and, and of course, people of color, and so on. Um, so, Randall Rayner is, was one of the leading figures before he moved from uh, CSA to a, a group called The Order. And he, so he, I'm quoting from Francis, Francis Flannery, who's a really superb uh, terrorism scholar. He was getting impatient because of how bad things were getting in the world. He finally added that if the Lord didn't hurry up and start Armageddon, he was determined to start it himself. Uh, Timothy McVeigh was most definitely influenced by Christian identity beliefs. And then taping Heavenly Kingdom, I mentioned a moment ago that in World War II, they have been, that Hitler actually had some, you know, in essence, a grand narrative that had an eschatological component, and that was partly what motivated uh, his, uh, you know, his violent acts. The second most deadly conflict in human history was the taping Heavenly Kingdom, which resulted in 30 to 35 million deaths. And this was, um, so the taping rebellion involved taping Heavenly Kingdom run by Hong, who was battled with the Qing Dynasty. And again, just like massive, you know, massive casualties. Okay, so the so that's category number one, apocalyptic terrorists. Uh, radical negative utilitarians. So negative utilitarian is an ethical theory that believes uh, the reduction of suffering is uh, is important. Uh, a strong version of this view claims that the reduction of suffering is all that matters. Uh, so once you have eliminated suffering, then you were moral uh, duties are discharged, and, and there's nothing else to do. So this led Warren Smart in, I think, 1958 to publish the most famous criticism of, of this version, which is that, obviously, if you want to eliminate suffering, uh, one way to do that is to eliminate uh, the entities that suffer. So you should, if you're a strong uh, native utilitarian, uh, become a world explorer. Uh, so uh, recall the graph, of course, maybe that might be possible at some point. Uh, so, moral internalism essentially says that uh, moral motivation is subsumed within moral judgment. Uh, so, you know, if you genuinely believe that uh, uh, you know, it's wrong to pollute, that belief itself has some kind of like normative force that makes you be a certain way. Uh, so, I'm just kind of adding in this uh, slightly arcane detail here, but if moral internalism is false and in fact a majority of philosophers don't accept moral internalism, then we can distinguish between radical and you and strong and you. Where strong and you is just the the epistemic commitment to eliminating suffering, and to write about you is, the, is that commitment plus the actual motivation to go out and eliminate suffering. Um, so David Pierce, who's a well-known um, and you um, of a particular variety, maybe lexical threshold, uh, as Toby Ordis said, estimates that there are a few hundreds, uh, or at most a few thousand persons scattered across the globe who currently acknowledge the NU title. My own sense, which is not uh, particularly robust, is that this number is increasing and may very well increase in the future. Um, there are also a few notable philosophers and scientists who have held something in, the, in this sort of uh, philosophical neighborhood. So that was number two. Number three is uh, uh, extreme eco-terrorists. Um, by this term, I, I use this term very imprecisely. So it refers to like kind of a, a, a wide range of overlapping but nonetheless distinct phenomena. These include deep ecology extremists, radical environmentalists, eco-fascists, anti-civilization fanatics, uh, violent technophobes, anarcho-pronivists, militant neoluddites, and fringe eco-anarchists, or green anarchists. <coughs> um, so if you combine a biocentric view, uh, ecocentric view, or um, a view sometimes called biosphere egalitarianism, according to which the intrinsic value of human beings is the same as the intrinsic value of any other living organism. And you combine it with this eschatological narrative of human homo sapiens um, destroying the natural world, which turns out is, is evidentially uh, uh, 
corroborated, you end up with um, this sort of active genocidal or homicidal ideology. Uh, so there are many, many examples. James Lee was a guy who held uh, several people hostage in, in the Discovery Channel headquarters. And, uh, and he wrote this manifesto, included lines like, the humans, the planet does not need humans. Suggests a kind of like, you know, view that according to which human extinction would not be a bad thing. There's the Human Liberation Front, which is based in Toronto, and, uh, and still active, as, as far as I know. They have written that you know, nuclear weapons are not ideal way of eliminating humans, because there's a huge um, toll on the biosphere. Uh, they go through, you know, sterilization is much too slow, and so on. And then they conclude that genetically engineered viruses have the advantage of attacking only the target species. To complicate the search for a cure or a vaccine, and as insurance against the possibility that some humans, capital H, might be immune to a particular virus, several different viruses could be released, with provision being made for the release of a second round after the generals and the politicians had come out of their shelters. Um, so uh, you find similar sentence in Earth First uh, Journal uh, from 1989. Somebody wrote that contributions are urgently solicited for scientific research on a species-specific virus that will eliminate Homo shittichus uh, from the planet. Only an absolutely species-specific virus should be set loose, otherwise it would be just another technological fix. Uh, Pentiglincola is a Finnish uh, self-described ecofascist, and he has um, many views that uh, one might find very objectionable. Uh, his, in fact, the only book he's ever written that's been translated into English is, is uh, a, a fairly recent one a few years ago called Can Life Prevail? And it's, it's uh, I can't recommend it, but it's quite a read. Uh, on a global scale, the main problem is the inflation of human life. It's not the inflation of human life, but it's ever-increasing minus overvaluation. He argues that a, second world, a third world war um, would be a happy occasion for the planet, and to avoid an eco-catastrophe, some transnational body or small group equipped with sophisticated technology and bearing responsibility for the whole world should attack the great inhabited centers of the globe. Finally, um, perhaps most uh, eerily for me at least, uh, if there were a button I could press, I would sacrifice myself without hesitation if it meant millions of people would die. So that's number three. The fourth category, human category, is, uh, is idiosyncratic actors. These are just individuals who are motivated by um, idiosyncratic ideologies, normative worldviews, and so on, where these ideologies, et cetera, don't fit into any of the previous three categories. So there's, uh, Rimke and Shooters are a, uh, a paradigmatic example of this. There's a very well-known scholar named Peter Langman, who is kind of the, the leading uh, academic who has, uh, he, he runs a website called schoolshooters.com, and it's, it's a tremendous resource. So he has this tripartite distinction of rape shooters, the psychopathic, people who don't feel empathy, who, uh, who quintessentially lack um, a conscience. So the psychotic people who are suffering from uh, delusions, uh, or you know, delusions, hallucinations, um, things of that sort. And then there's the traumatized people who just had a really awful life history. Um, so I think the first two are probably most relevant to the discussion of agential risk. Um, Peter Lightman has written that all of these, but particularly the first two categories, but all of these are, uh, these, these individuals are motivated by what he calls existential rage, just a deep and deep hatred of humanity or the human condition. Many just wanted to kill as many people uh, before they die. And again, there, there are lots and lots of examples. Um, I'll just give a few here. And again, this is, it, it's, this is unpleasant reading. Um, Eric Harris, he was the mastermind for the 1999 Columbine uh, school shooting, and um, which, had, which actually, if his plan had gone correctly, it would have resulted in some 600 students who died, because he created this propane uh, bomb that, that failed. But he, I, if I remember correctly, he had actually created this bomb before and got it to work. So, um, yeah, if you recall your history, the Nazis came up with a final solution to the Jewish problem, kill them all. Well, in case you haven't figured it out yet, I say, kill mankind. No one should survive. He also wrote, uh, I think I would want us to go extinct. I just wish I could actually do this instead of just dream about it all. And I, I do have a long paper that, uh, that goes into a lot more detail, and the guy really had just the most ghoulish horrific fantasies of torture and rape and just, the, you know, the worst imaginable. Um, 
So Bovinin, I'll skip him, uh, although he's a Finnish shooter from, I think, within the last 10 years. Same with Matthew Sari, uh, who's, who writes, I hate the human race, I hate mankind, I hate the whole world, and I want to kill as many people as possible. Uh, Elliot Roger had a weird fixation on women in particular. He didn't want to kill, uh, uh, he, I think he wanted to kill men, but he didn't want to exterminate men, he more or less wanted to exterminate women. Uh, Sebastian Boss, all I want now is killing, hurting, and scarring as much people as possible. Sometimes I write stuff in English because I want everyone to understand what the hell I'm talking about. Um, a general note, many of the token agents here, these individuals, um, are fairly smart, and many of them are fairly intelligent. Eric Harrison, Dylan Klebold, who was his, his, uh, his sidekick, who actually was uh, psychotic rather than psychopathic, uh, they were really gifted kids. Eric Harris quoted Shakespeare and talked about Thomas Hobbes and, and uh, Nietzsche. Uh, Ted Kaczynski, of course, had a, he would be a violent neo uh, He would be in that subcategory. He had a PhD from Harvard, of course, in mathematics. Um, most Earth Liberation Front people have a technical background in engineering, something like that, and um, are very, fairly smart. Al-Baghdadi, who's the current caliph of the of Daesh, the Islamic State, he has a PhD from a, that meant to say good school, <laughs> instead of God's school. Um, so he didn't get a PhD in, in, from a God's school. It was Bag Baghdad University. It's a good school. Um, before it was you know, destroyed. Um, Ayman al Zawahiri, he's the he's number two in Al Qaeda for the longest time. He's now number one since Bin Laden was, was killed in the Battle of um, He's an eye surgeon. Many members of Al Shabrikyo, so I'm sure probably a lot of people here know, the, the Asahar Shoko drew from the top institutions in Japan. Uh, and that's in fact how they were able to, to uh, create these extraordinary bio labs and, and uh, this arsenal of chemical weapons. Um, okay, so returning to this graph, um, I, I, you might uh, talk about the RWA formula, ready, willing, and able. So the graph itself pertains to the able part. And I've tried to show just now, and I, and I think in papers show hopefully a bit more, even more convincingly, that there are many agents who are absolutely willing and uh, may or may not be, you know, maybe uh, ready as well. So, as, so as, you know, I, in other words, two of the three necessary sufficient conditions for some kind of truly catastrophic um, attack on humanity with existential implications are satisfied. The third one is being satisfied as a result of emerging technology, biotechnology, synthetic biology, uh, molecular nanotechnology, AI, and so on. So this is a very worrisome situation. All right, so questions. Is it the topic of agential risks subsumed within the fields of political science, uh, terrorism studies, psychology, and so on? Um, you, might call, you might refer to Akin's anti sexual rule, um, which one was not multiplying the allogisms beyond necessity. So to answer the first question, I would say yes and no. I mean, they're, they're definitely, I mean, there are terrorism scholars who focus on populist terrorism. Um, I mentioned Peter Langman discusses, uh, uh, you know, some of these omnicidal, uh, psychotic individuals. Um, I should add, though, I, I think there's been very little. Maybe someone can correct me, but I, I think Anders has discussed, uh, has thought about omnicidal agents quite a bit. But I, I don't know of really a lot of uh, research. I don't know anybody who's actually thought hard about this. And for good reason, of course, the means, which is, you know, the instrumental means, the essential component to the ready, willing, and able uh, equation has never been uh, satisfied. Except by states around 1945. Um, so on one hand, there, there are some agents who might not ever ping someone's radar, except when viewed from the existential risk perspective. So for example, radical and use in general, you know, Maybe there's a little bit of debate about this, but they wouldn't be this, you know, negative, uh, obviously bad additions to your community. They care about reducing suffering. That sounds great to me. So these agents pose a risk in and only in the specific context of exceptionally powerful, sufficiently accessible dual-use technologies. Um, so are there other context-specific risks like this that currently elude our detection? I don't know. Maybe it's a. It, it's a. There's hasn't been a lot of research on this issue. There are also triggers that might uh, that either become visible 
or are magnified when viewed through the existential risk, from the existential risk perspective. So triggers the event are events that produce a sudden increase in the probability of a terror agent causing existential catastrophe. Uh, one example is space colonization. Uh, there's the, the cliche, uh, even in the space uh, expansion, expansionist literature about you know, spreading, we don't want all our eggs in one basket. You know, and, and, and of course, there are evolutionary um, analogs to this. The further out a species is spread geographically, the greater its probability of survival. So it makes sense that if we spread through the three dimensions of space, uh, the probability of an existential catastrophe will go down. Um, so uh, there might be some, for example, an omnicycle agent who, who uh, wants to, to uh, essentially cause the termination of our evolutionary lineage. That's going to be a lot easier if we don't have Earth-independent colonies on Mars. So news, uh, this is information hazard, essentially. News about space colonization or about it, a Martian colony that is about to become Earth-independent um, could be a trigger for some sort of attack. In fact, there are really long, um, horrifying Reddit uh, discussions where someone will say, like, do you think just humanity deserves to uh, go extinct? And you have like 100 people below who are like, absolutely, I'm a terrible species. Um, and I've even found some people mentioning space colonization. Like, if we're going to destroy humanity, we really need to do it before we, we colonize the galaxy. Uh, and interestingly, the timeline of Martian colonies seems to lag behind, potentially, the timeline for the development uh, of really powerful synthetic biology, maybe even molecular nanotechnology. So that's something to, to be aware of. Another trigger is date-specific prophecies, or what I call eschatological pressure points. Um, these can produce sudden uh, spikes in, uh, from agential risks. Not many terrorism scholars are thinking much about this. 2076, uh, let me go backwards. So 1979 was a year in which there was quite a bit of apocalyptic fervor in the Muslim world. And manifestations of that were these Iranian revolution, which was largely seen as an apocalyptic occurrence. Uh, there was also the Grand Mosque seizure, where 500 insurgents uh, took over the, the, this really massive edifice in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia, and held 100,000 people hostage. Uh, and, and the standoff with the Saudi Arabian government lasted for about uh, two weeks. And the reason they were there is they claimed to have the Mahdi, who is the Islamic end of days messianic figure. Uh, why is 1979? Well, that was the turn of the century in the Islamic calendar. That was 1400 AH. Uh, so there's, there's, there's historical precedents, and actually if you read the, the scholarship, there are a lot of, um, there are a few, I should say, there are a few scholars who have most definitely identified 2076 as a point where there might be uh, an anomalous amount of violence and tension and conflict. Uh, David Cook is, widely regarded as like the leading expert of uh, Islamic apocalypticism in the Western world, uh, also suggests that 2039, uh, mostly among the, the, the Shiite communities, uh, could be worrisome, it could result in, in uh, unprecedented uh, conflict. It's, it's because that's the 1200th, uh, 1200th um, anniversary of the occultation of the 12th Imam, who's the Mahdi. And 12 or Shia is Islam is the, the uh, major form in like Iraq and Iran. Anyways, April 15th to 20th, 15th is uh, tax filing day in the US, 20th is Hitler's birthday. Um, it's generally the case that if you look at a lot of uh, terrorist attacks from right wing groups, they happen between the 15th and the 20th. Um, uh, April 19th was one of the Lexington and Concord battles broke out, and so that's been, there have been many, many cases. Um, the, uh, I'm getting off the top of my head, maybe the Waco happened, uh, ended, the Waco standoff ended uh, April, 5th, April 19th. Eric Harris, the Columbine attacker, was <coughs> planning uh, to attack on April 19th, and then delayed one day to come inside with Hitler's birthday. So those are triggers. They're also exacerbatory factors. Uh, these are phenomena that will worsen the threat posed by different agential types. Um, I think a moment ago you were talking about like biodiversity loss, and there's you know there's a 2012 study in Nature that suggested we could be approaching a sudden, irreversible, catastrophic collapse of the global ecosystem, and this would have really significant uh, consequences for the stability of civilization. 
Um, climate change, of course, you know, there was a 2015 study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that, that uh, um, argued, I believe quite convincingly, that there, um, there was a drought from 20, 2009 to 2010, I think, that was unprecedented in Syria. And this led to a mass uh, influx of, of rural individuals into the major urban centers of Syria, which, uh, and once you get to that point, then most historians will, will say, oh yeah, that was a major reason that you ended up with the Syrian civil war. Um, and as people like David Tidley of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists have mentioned, uh, it, it, there's a very easy link to make between the, the Syrian civil war being a petri disc, disc, uh, dish in which the Islamic State, um, from which the Islamic State emerged. And at that point, they were really floundering group because of their apocalyptic uh, predictions that all failed. Um, so I think as climate change gets worse, uh, it will fuel a terror, not just terrorism, but apocalyptic terrorism. This is a view shared by a number of people. Mark Jurgensmeyer has a paper explicitly about this. Um, Francis Flannery, uh, I mentioned earlier, and others have also mentioned that uh, as environmental degradation worsens, the threat from eco-terrorism will increase. And in fact, I think it was, um, there was a major journal that just came out with a really interesting article about how eco-terrorists, eco there's, there's going to be this wave of eco-terrorism in the future, and we need to prepare for that now. Um, so these factors acquire a new level of urgency and importance, I would argue, when viewed within the framework of agential risks. There are also different agent tool configurations that nobody's really studied. Um, uh, so just one easy example is radical end users are unlikely to acquire and build it, or build an arsenal of nuclear weapons. The radical end you nuclear weapons configuration is improbable. Uh, part, of, part of it's because of what I call the last few people problem. It's really easy to figure out how to kill a huge number of people, but it's, it turns out it's actually pretty difficult to figure out how to kill the last few remaining groups. Um, so I think an end you would say, well, I don't want to be pretty suffering. I really need something that's, that's quick and clean and, uh, and has a high probability, a high reliability factor um, with respect to eliminating uh, you know, sentient life. Um, so maybe designer pathogens, um, that also I think suffers a bit from the less people problem, but especially self-replicating nanobots, if they're, you know, you could release these ecophagic uh, little, little machines into the environments and then, um, you know, in a matter of maybe 90 minutes or maybe a month or something, the whole entire biosphere is destroyed. And this has the virtue of not only eliminating current humans, but eliminating the potential for, uh, for life that has the capacity to suffer uh, the evolving in the future. Um, another possibility, yeah, okay, so um, anti-risk enforcement operations in the future should focus on, right, and use acquiring, not, not only focus on acquiring nukes, but on them setting up any biohacker labs or uh, doing a little bit of research into nanotechnology. Another issue is prioritization. Few terrorism scholars are focused on apocalyptic terrorism in particular. Uh, in fact, terrorism studies wasn't that big of a field before 2001. Uh, it was just seen as kind of a minor, you know, state conflict was a much, much more pressing issue. So, um, you know, since this is the only type of religious terrorism which itself incidentally, is the most violent form of terrorism in the world today. So, since it's the only type of terrorism with existential risk implications, perhaps you could make a moral argument that it should be prioritized over studying like sovereign citizen people. These are, these are like far-right individuals in the US who believe that the state has no control over them. Uh, there's some like horrible videos of them you know, being pulled over by the police and they jump out and, and shoot the, the police officer. Um, it, it's a terrible, worrying, phenomenon, but from an existential risk perspective, it's perhaps not the, and in fact, the FBI is, I believe, has classified sovereign citizen movement as the number one or number two greatest threat, domestic terrorist threat. Maybe from a different perspective, uh, you should be focusing more on Christian identity or you know, something like that. Um, if you got a few psychologists that are studying brain issues, if this category of agent could pose an existential danger in the future, perhaps one might argue it could be prioritized. Basically, the urgency and importance of studying certain types of agents becomes clear only through the lens of existential risk. There's also, um, I think this is this 
pretty much the last issue, the topic that I'll be discussing here, information hazards. Um, there's a problem talking about this issue. Unlike technologies, this is, a, this is my deep thought of the day, unlike technologies, people have feelings. So this yields the dilemma of inquiry. Uh, ignoring agential risks could leave us unnecessarily vulnerable to an existential catastrophe, since it would impede us from devising effective agent-oriented mitigation strategies, yet talking about agential risks could unnecessarily elevate the probability that an agent chooses to press a doomsday button. So how often, let me ask you, how often do you make plans to do something you know it's impossible to do? So one information hazard might be simply the knowledge that um, the technological capacity to wreak unprecedented global scale uh, havoc on uh, civilization today, that itself could inspire agents to actively pursue an existential harm. In this way, can leads to will, given some prior laws. So I believe that you know, the world would be better if, if homo sapiens were uh, exterminated, but I'm not going to do that because I don't have a way to do that. Oh, I just realized that there is a way to do that. So now I'm going to go and do it. So uh, essentially these agents, to, to borrow from the uh, apocalyptic terrorist uh, uh, Richard Randy's uh, figure, essentially sort of migrate from the passive to the, the active mode simply as a result of knowing that there are levers that, that they can pull to, um, to realize their omnicidal or apocalyptic or anti-civilizational uh, fantasies. All categories except, there's another issue, all categories except idiosyncratic actors are motivated by what they see as moral concerns. Apocalyptic terrorists, the eco-terrorists, if you read their literature, it's, it's absolutely uh, imbued with a kind of moral, like, you know, Humanity, it's, it's wrong, it's a, it's a moral tragedy that, he, that the biosphere is wilting as a result of our activities. So thus, uh, discovering that some fancy academics are talking about you as a threat to humanity that must be neutralized could be quite incendiary. Um, notice that the realization of some agents' goals would thwart the realization of other agents' goals. For example, if the anarcho-primitives, who want to return to essentially a paleolithic kind of uh, uh, mode of existence where to get their way, apocalyptic terrorists would. But also, the goals of some agents align. Some would like, for, for different reasons, some would like the same end. Human extinction, um, uh, the collapse of civilization, so on. So, I don't know, just a, a, a conjecture, knowledge of each other's existence could lead to the formation of cooperating networks of different agent types, motivated by different ideologies, but whose final goals are Compatible. Um, all right, almost done here. Finally, scholarship on agential risk could lead token agents to become more secretive. Uh, if they know that uh, some transhumanist leaning folks who care a lot about existential risk are super worried about them, uh, they that obviously would, might lead them to uh, uh, not to tweet about their views or something. So, and for reasons outlined elsewhere in a paper of mine, I believe that now is probably the optimal time to, to really talk about this openly. And I don't know, maybe in the future there might, you might have some kind of, uh, Andrew sort of gestured at this, uh, and I think Robin had an interesting idea about um, the, I think it was like the FISA court model or something like that. Anyways, um, yeah, so I think now is probably the best time. We're sort of in between, you know, on the, that graph, of the, the destructive capabilities, you know, we're sort of like down here, but I think we're rapidly moving up here, and it might be especially dangerous to talk about uh, these individuals once uh, they can go out and uh, get access to weapons of total destruction. Um, just conclusion, and then I'm done, because I, I can see you're, you're ready to uh, pop up. Agential risks are defined as individuals or perhaps groups who could pass the doomsday button test. In other words, they're agents who would either trip our species into the eternal grave of extinction or irreversibly catapult us into the Stone Age through error or terror. And we, I give it, the second half of this book is mostly on terror. While there are scholars studying terrorists, criminals, psychopaths, dictators, and so on, the agential risk framework looks at this diverse cluster of phenomena through a particular morally significant prism, namely the prism of existential risk. Uh, the result is a uniquely interdisciplinary set of target explanata, things to be explained, that are special in their urgency and importance. 
given the rapid and ongoing distribution of offensive capabilities across society via the development of dual-use emerging technologies. Um, and then here are just some uh, books and papers I've written about the issues. Thanks. So you said now is a good moment to talk about this. Let's spend a, a few minutes doing just that. I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Alexi Turchin, and with this uh, map of possible type of uh, doom engine risks, it is rational doomsday engines. This is the one who create rational engine, who create a doomsday bomb and then blackmail all the world to give him power. And for example, North Korea could do it in 10 or 20 years. How do you think, in what category you should include this type of risks? Attention risks. Um, well, I mean, in that case, North Korea is, uh, I mean, most regimes are uh, interested in existential catastrophes, right? Because you can't rule the world if the world is But you could just create a ball and blackmail the world and uh, if they refuse, you, you blow out all the doors. Yeah, your threat's credible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's a good thing to think about as well. And in fact, I, I think I might have passed over it. I also talked about the possibility of altruistic agents. You know, if there's really a good uh, chance that a suffering risk, you know, some really catastrophic outcome, uh, or, or according to some model, yeah, there's a high probability that we're going to end up in some kind of like hellish situation in the future. That might spur a genuinely altruistic person to try to exterminate but, humanity. But that would be surprising if altruistic agents would collaborate with North Korea to do the bomb. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, as someone with considerable negativity in the theory of leaning, thanks for several negative areas, I would somewhat object to your frequent use of 10 years as an example, given that. I neither, nor neither uh, any of my friends want to destroy the world. Uh, I realize that you uh, always qualified this with radical negative utilitarians, so specifically the kind of people who will actually take their formal ethical theory really literally and follow it to no matter how great conclusion it leads to. Uh, however, if you are talking about those kinds of people, and you might end up with similar risks from a lot of different ethical theories, like if you have classical utilitarians, maybe some of them decide that, hey, it would be a net good for the utility of the world if we used nuclear weapons to reduce overpopulation and have a better quality of life for the surviving people, and so on. Or maybe it would be better to kill everyone so we have the resources to have great new genetically engineered people who are happier than in your existing people and so on. So if you so the like the class of risk here is seems to be more about people who take their ethical theories too literally rather than negative utilitarians in particular. I totally agree. So I also have kind of any leanings. Um, <laughs> And, but, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but I think suffering is, uh, I mean, some of the articles that, like, the Foundational Research Institute have put out were the thought experiments. I don't know if they're original, I, I have the impression that they are, but, you know, you can just imagine, like, some people are suffering, um, and some people are sort of happy. Um, um, but basically, you know, you, you seem to be drawn more towards like helping. You know, if I find out resources, I think I'm going to go and help the people who are suffering rather than make the happy people a bit more blissful. Um, and I also completely agree about other ethical systems. So, like in in the book, I I talk about classical utilitarianism as well under the banner of uh, you know the perhaps controversial banner of misguided ethicists. Um, so. Misguided from a particular, you know, and I'm pretty, I hope I'm pretty clear about that from a particular, like, existential, you know, uh, perspective. Um, so, yeah, misguided eth ethicists, that's a broader category that, in which you can fit, you know, some, somebody who wants to create the, the uh, um, I'm blanking on it now, uh, but the shockwave that David Pierce talks about 
a utilitronium shockwave that expands in all directions and destroys all life to convert uh, to convert matter into the uh, it's some sort of configuration of matter and energy that optimizes for bliss. And yeah, that would be uh, I don't know, good from one perspective. I would <laughs> not be fan of that. But does that answer most of the questions? And and, and I also actually I've written in one of the papers about information hazards. I think talking about NU, for example, as radical NU, or strong, absolute NU, is, is talking about it exactly like that is really important. And there's a big information hazard risk. If suddenly somebody comes along and they're writing like a popular piece and they're saying, oh yeah, this, uh, this nerdy guy over here says NUs are, you know, are the worst thing in the world and, and threaten our, you know, the future of humanity, that would be kind of bad, because there are a lot of NUs who are, you know, perfectly are not threatening from this perspective. It's just the radical variety. So I think that's an information hazard. That in, 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 I'm trying to really take care to to distinguish between like NU. There's NU. There's like threshold NU, level NU, weak NU. There's there's many many varieties, uh, including myself, who's just kind of like NU leaning, you know, <laughs> NU curious or something. <laughs> Uh, I saw in uh, your list that uh, you published uh, on moral bioenhancement and agential risk. Uh, could you say something about your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's forthcoming. That's like in press right now. Okay. And um, so basically, the idea is like, you know, a person in Sapolescu, uh, in one person in, in Julian Sapolescu, uh, wrote a book called Unfit for the Future, and it's it's really interesting, really sophisticated book talking about how. Um, you know, the, uh, climate change is a major, major slow motion catastrophe, and we're just not going to solve. You know, it, it, it arises from a tragedy of the commons, and we're just not going to solve that unless we have greater moral capacities. Uh, in particular, our empathy, our sympathetic concern, and our, our uh, sense of justice it has to be enhanced for us to actually navigate this, uh, to obviate this this catastrophe. Um, and so the, the idea is then to to produce moral bio enhancements, maybe something like oxytocin, and and perhaps I think they've shied away from this a little bit, but perhaps create some compulsory program so that everybody has to morally, you know, you can put it like fluoride in the public water system, uh, and you maybe you make it compulsory so that uh, you don't have free riders. If you do this, then I think there are some uh, agential risks that could be made worse. I, I think like apocalyptic terrorists are individuals who who lack empathy. You know, empathy it tends to to co to coincide with the, the the borders of their particular doxastic group. You know, um, so but I think there are others like maybe and use. I mean, if you enhance their capacity to feel for others <coughs> and to be motivated to help others, um, it might actually make might increase the probability that radical end use will, in the, that future, you know, wherever it is exactly in terms of destructive capability, will uh, try to inflict, try to, to exterminate humanity. And so there are other examples as well, like eco terrorists. Um, you know, it's not like a like their more their circle of moral concerns is pretty broad. And also, again, you know, person said last we talk about not just worldwide enhancement, but cognitive enhancement. And a lot of the, the risks here, they're really smart people. You know, these aren't like the incompetent fools. So I, I just does that make sense? Like that perspective? 